welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti and I will be your hostess. Here on Racket Reviews, we are dedicated to learning about all things organized crime. And today I'm really looking forward to beginning our discussion about the Tampa Mafia. After our coverage about the New Orleans Mafia and Carlos Marcello, I realized that there were a lot of gaps and questions that were left unanswered in our coverage of Marcello about the Florida connection. And since I never like to leave my audience with a stone unturned, we're going to start our investigation today. If you're enjoying the channel and would like to become a Racket Reviews patron, please head on over to the Patreon account and join the Coletti family. Now, without further ado, we have much to discuss about sunny Florida, so let's get right to it. Mafia control of the state of Florida really began in Tampa with politicians in the 20th century. Most of our family stories begin much earlier and include a history stretching back to the old country, but as you'll see, Florida is an exceptional case in many ways. The first weird turn we're going to make in our coverage of Florida's Sicilian Mafia is by covering a privileged white guy who came from a politically advantageous family. Son of Dr. John Perry Wall and Matilda McKay Wall, Charles, or Charlie as he liked to be called, McKay Wall, enjoyed a life of luxury. His mother came from a prominent Tampa family. His father was a well-respected physician who had served as a Confederate Army surgeon, then director of Richmond Hospitals during the Civil War, then mayor of Tampa, then one of the Surgeon General's top consultants in yellow fever research. Charlie Wall, it would seem, had every ingredient to become one of Tampa's most prominent men, and in a way, I suppose he did. Based on outside appearances though, his trajectory was a surprise. But let's take a peek behind the curtain of outward appearance to find the truth. Wall's father struggled with alcoholism. In fact, Matilda McKay's father violently refused his request to marry Matilda because of his known reputation as a drunk. When Wall promised to never touch alcohol again to marry Matilda, her father agreed. Dr. Wall did not keep his promise and after a couple years of marriage had fallen back off the wagon. To make matters worse, Matilda McKay died when Charlie was only 13 years old and just six months later, his father would marry for a third time. Dr. Wall had tragically lost a wife prior to Matilda. Just six months after the passing of his mother, Charlie's father would marry a woman named Louisa Williams from Virginia. Louisa Williams was physically abusive to Charlie Wall, and his father's alcoholism, and likely violence or at least neglect, would lead Charlie Wall down a dark path. Dr. Wall would pass away soon after, and Louisa Wall, who now had custody of the doctor's son, died as a result of her injuries after Charlie Wall shot her with a 22 caliber pistol. This story about killing his stepmother is actually considered a rumor, but the history of the Wall family is deep and vast and well-documented. I'll probably be doing a spotlight on just that family later on, so stay tuned for that information. In any case, Wall's privilege did stop him from serving any jail time, but he would be sent off to military school. While Wall was a good student, he would soon be expelled after he was found visiting a brothel. Wall's life was already marked by crime and licentiousness as he was known, not only as a murderer, but a drinker, gambler, morphine addict, and brothel goer riddled with mental health issues. While these qualities would exclude a man from running for office, put aside what you know about politicians today, this was a different time, they made him a perfect candidate for running a criminal empire. Wall understood early the balance that had to be struck between politics and illegal endeavors. By coupling his love of gambling with his vast network of political connections, Wall quickly took over the Bolita rackets. Bolita, which literally is Spanish for little ball, is a Cuban and or Puerto Rican form of gambling very similar to the Italian lottery rackets we have covered in our previous episodes about New York. Mob bosses made their money by rigging the Bolita games, either by adding extra numbered balls into the bag or, more cleverly, by freezing the balls to be drawn ahead of time, with its icy temperature being the indicator for the person drawing that that was the right number. This gambling racket was huge and illegal during the beginning of the 20th century. The Bolita rackets included several bosses, including the Antonores and the Traficantes, which we will discuss later. But by flexing his political muscle, Wall was able to consolidate the numbers racket in Tampa, a racket which he ran from Ybor City, northeast of downtown Tampa. He ran this multicultural racket, including Irish, Italian, Spanish, and Cuban mobsters, with the help of the Cuban mobster Evaristo or Tito Rubio, with whom he co-owned the El Dorado Club and Casino. El Dorado was among the most famous of Wall's establishments, although far from the only one. El Dorado was an exclusive casino, with a bordello on its second floor, nightly bolita games, card tables, a roulette wheel, and plenty of booze, even during Prohibition. The balcony that ran along the interior is where armed guards kept watch over the patrons. They also kept a lookout for any rival families or a rogue law enforcement officer who might dare to cross paths with Wall. The Bolita racket was originally operated out of Cuba, very close to Florida, and Wall was able to wrestle the Cuban game out of the hands of the Cuban mobsters. What made Wall so formidable was of course his political corruption. By purchasing votes in key precincts, Wall was able to maintain his power and control the narrative and laws on gambling by proxy. Wall had such a strong political network 
that no one from school board member to mayor was being elected without his approval. And if Wall could manipulate the votes to go his way, he would simply stuff the ballot boxes when it came time to count. Meanwhile, Belita King Wall is known to have had at least six rivals violently killed for opposing him. He was ruthless, violent, and interestingly, soft-spoken and charitable. He was known to give tons of charity to churches and humanitarian efforts. He would personally intervene on behalf of 900 needy working-class families in the cigar business. This included many Cuban families during a strike in 1910. Despite Wall's open and public involvement in election fraud and illegal activities, he barely spent any time in jail. In fact, the only real issue that ever came his way, legally speaking, was a 1931 narcotics violation from which he was sentenced to two years in prison, but this decision was reversed by the U.S. Court of Appeals. Wall's hand in the corruption of the judicial process is well established and would come into light in the Kefauver hearings of the 1950s, wherein Tampa's chief of police was unable to produce adequate records about the dozens of murders which had taken place in the city. In some cases, there were no records at all. There was evident mafia presence and corruption in Tampa, specifically during the city's era of blood from 1930 to 1959, with the majority of the violence taking place from 1930 to 1940. The violence and tension between Wall and the Italian factions had existed prior to 1930. While Wall's operations did employ some Italians, Wall's gangs were typically those in the Latin American community, specifically Cubans, after he had assisted all of those families in 1910. A large portion of the Italian mobsters were wrapped up in trying to get Wall out of the Bolita business so they could take over. Unfortunately for these Italian mobsters, Wall's control of law enforcement, elections, businesses, and Bolita made moving forward impossible for them. It seemed that the only hope of moving forward would have to come by way of divine intervention. Well, I don't know about divine, but it did come from a higher power, and that was the United States federal government with the passage of the 18th Amendment in 1919. The Italian crews got to work in the illegal booze business, but Wall, who no doubt enjoyed a good illegal activity here and there, focused more on making sure that the alcohol was available to patrons of his various clubs and casinos instead of getting his hands dirty with rum running, moonshining, and bootlegging. The Italian mobsters were busy making their money with illegal booze through the 1920s. Those who were content to rise above their station and stay under the radar would limit their operations just to bootlegging. However, those with higher ambitions knew that the money made and political influence earned from their work in the alcohol rackets meant that they had a shot at control of Tampa. And to paraphrase the Hamilton musical, that is not the first, nor will it be the last time that I reference America's musical, and if you haven't seen it, you need to. These young, scrappy, and hungry Italian mobsters were not throwing away their shot. The two big names that you'll want to keep in mind on the Italian side are Ignacio Antonori and Santo Traficante Sr. Antonori was a Sicilian-born Floridian mobster who was involved heavily in not only bootlegging, but also he was responsible for building one of the earliest narcotics trafficking networks. With his sons, Paul and Joseph, Antonori was able to expand this narcotics operation across the country. During this time, Antonori was the head of the Tampa crime crew that was able to successfully go against Wall's criminal network. It's important to be clear here that there was no one Tampa family until, spoiler alert, Santo Traficante Sr. was able to consolidate all of the families who were going against Wall. Since Traficante worked for slash with him, Antonori is often credited with being the first crime boss of the Tampa family. Other important Italian mobsters and criminal families included the Diacidue family, also involved in narcotics and later associates with the Traficante family, Agustin Lazara, who ran an important Bolita operation in his Yellow House bar, the Velasco brothers, who were heavily involved with rigging elections for mafia circles, and the Italiano family, which included Ignacio and his nephew Salvatore. Sal Italiano was an important associate of Antinori as he was the leader of the Italian gambling operations while Antonori took care of narcotics. The Velasco brothers would be valuable as a starting point for taking over the power of election fraud. Agustin Lazara would be important as a frontman for illegal gambling operations, and the Diacidue family would quickly associate with Santo Traficante Sr. in the drug trade. Acknowledgement of a Tampa family didn't even begin until 1928. It was in that year that Ignacio Italiano and his associate Giuseppe Vaglica were arrested in a police raid of a mafia meeting in Cleveland, Ohio. Vaglica's main operations were narcotics and diamond smuggling, while Italiano and his nephew were kingpins in the world of narcotics. Antonori would soon see the potential in Santo Traficante, who by 18 had already controlled a powerful young street gang. Antonori could certainly use the type of street smarts and muscle that Traficante's crew provided. By the end of the Prohibition era, these factions had formed a coalition, and by the time Santo Traficante took the helm, they were an organized and complete mafia family. 
the Trafficante family, but not until 1940, after the arrest of Italiano and Baglica in 1928, the acknowledgement of, and fear about, the existence of an Italian mafia in Tampa, like the mafias of Chicago and New York, took root. The realization of the Tampa's family existence came a bit too late, as they had already become extremely powerful thanks to the money and trade routes created during the height of the Prohibition era. Now powerful enough to go against Wall and, well, his wall of political and police protection, the Tampa family got to work. Gone were Charlie Wall's comfortable days of easily controlling Tampa. By the end of the 1920s, he was fighting to maintain his power, and from 1930 to 1959, the era of blood plagued the city. During this time, there were over 25 mafia-related murders. The era began on June 9, 1930, while Wall was standing in front of his garage door. Suddenly, a vehicle went speeding by and opened fire on the Bolita King. Fortunately for Wall, t'was but a flesh wound on his shoulder. Other Tampa gangsters would not be so lucky. After this attack on Wall, Antonori Associates would take the first losses. The Antonori Associate deaths were as follows. Joe Vaglica on July 10, 1937, Mario Perla on October 12, 1939, and later, Tropicante Associate Jimmy Velasco was killed on December 12, 1948. There were many others, but these were among the highest ranking in Antonori's association. Antonori and Tropicante did not take these attacks lying down, though. On November 10, 1936, one of Wall's top lieutenants and associates with Lucky Luciano in New York, George Saturday Zarate, was shot in front of the El Dorado Casino by two gunmen from a moving vehicle. He would survive this attack, then move to Cuba, where he would eventually do business with Santo Traficante to establish the gambling operations there. On March 8, 1938, in addition to taking out various smaller Wall associates, the Antonori gang completed the huge task of taking out Wall's right-hand man, Tito Rubio. A second attempt was made on Wall's life on June 4, 1939. While he was driving, and apparently after having done some pretty impressive evasive maneuvers according to his testimony in the Cofaber hearings years later, Wall survived another attempt on his life from gunmen in an armored truck during a high-speed chase. After Wall got away, the assailants attempted to burn the truck to hide the evidence. It's important to keep in mind that the loose association of Italian mobsters under Antonori, some say Antonori was never the boss of any type of family, was not the only competition in town. You also had rival Cuban bosses and the influence of Italian mobsters from other cities coming into Tampa for business with families and associates we have not discussed. The 1930s and 1940s during Tampa's blood era was an extremely chaotic time. To make matters worse, many of the files about these murders were either conveniently misplaced, destroyed, or never written down in the first place. Meanwhile, Wall just kept surviving attempt after attempt on his life. In the spring of 1940, while Wall was being driven, the driver slammed on his brakes and gunfire blasted into the car, but Wall kept his head down and survived. Again, later that year, Ignacio Antonori would be murdered. The murder of Ignacio Antonori seems like something that Charlie Wall would have orchestrated, but when we look a little deeper, it seems to have the indications of an inside job. On October 22, 1940, while Ignacio Antonori was enjoying a cup of coffee at the Palm Green Inn in Tampa with a friend and a young woman, a masked gunman appeared in the window and fired two shots into Antonori from a sawed-off shotgun. The murder weapon was able to be traced back to a store in New Orleans and was purchased by a man with an evidently fake alias of John Adams. I will refrain from making a second Hamilton reference in this video, you're welcome. Was Carlos Marcello already helping to move the Traficante family into place? It seems very possible. What's interesting is that this weapon had been purchased over a year earlier, on October 7, 1939, just under a week before the murder of Mario Perla, an Antonori associate who was killed by the same type of weapon. It's impossible to know if it was the exact same weapon used in both murder cases, but the evidence does seem suspicious. Following Antonori's death, the leadership of the Italian faction was in question. I mean, it always had been, but now Antonori was out of the role of de facto leader. The original narrative, and what I tend to believe, is that Santo Traficante Sr. took over the coalition, thus becoming the first official boss of Tampa and establishing the Traficante family. However, other reports claim that it wasn't until 1950 when Traficante became the undisputed boss of Tampa. These reports would maintain that Salvatore Italiano was the underboss of Antonori and thus had more influence in the Tampa family. Upon Antonori's death, it's believed that he would have been the next in line for control. When Italiano retired and left for Italy in 1948, it is then believed that James Lumia, an oil refinery owner and right-hand man of Salvatore Italiano, took over. Lumia was killed by shotgun on June 5, 1950. According to these sources, it was then that Traficante took control of Tampa. 
I have to politely disagree with this theory because Santo Traficante's influence in Tampa was undeniable. I'm under the impression that Salvatore Italiano was in with Traficante all along and served as his underboss following the murder of Antonori in 1940. When Italiano retired in 1948, I believe that Lumia took the role of underboss beneath Traficante and not the family headship. Either way, Santo Traficante would take the city of Tampa by storm and groom his son Santo Traficante Jr. to become the family leader during the golden era of the Mafia, but we'll talk more about that in our next episode. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Racket Reviews beginning our discussion about the Tampa Mafia. After our discussion about Carlos Marcello, like I said, I felt like the Florida connection left a lot of questions and I want to make sure that we give the Tampa family all of the credit that it deserves on this channel. Make sure to let me know in the comment section below or on Facebook and Twitter what you think about the Tampa Mafia. The golden era of the Mafia, much like United States presidential elections, often comes down to Florida, Florida, Florida. Also, don't forget to utilize the comment section and social media to let me know who or what you would like to see covered next. I always love hearing from you and I'm always happy to investigate. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications to get more Mafia content sent directly to your sub box. Ciao!